I want to look at Matthew chapter 5, 13 through 16. You have it on the screen. It's on your apps. It's in your phone. Some of you brought your Bibles tonight. I want to look at Matthew chapter 5. This is just a setup. Verse 13 says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty again? Like once it's gone, it's gone, right? Like how does it become restored? The Bible says it is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under men. Verse 14 says, he gives us another example. This is Jesus. Jesus is actually talking to us after he came down off the mountain to begin to teach and disciple his disciples. He was training them. He was instructing them. He gave them the Beatitudes, blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. And then he loads this on them, that you're the salt. And now he's about to show us that we are the light. Everybody say light. Verse 14 says, you are the light of the world as city situated on a hill that cannot be hidden. For no one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand. It gives light for all who are in the house. And in the same way, you shall let your light shine before all men so that they may see your good works and give glory to us so they see my works. And they're like, oh, my name is Mike Mitchell and everyone needs to look at me. No, 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 it, it, doesn't, say, it doesn't say look at us. It says that they're gonna look at your works and then what? Give glory to your father that's in heaven. I, I wanna break these two scriptures down just for a moment, just for a moment. I want you to see that there is salt and there is light and salt in the scripture here is giving us kind of the purpose that salt in today's culture is used for what? Flavor and preservation. We see this. Oh, you put a little salt on the carrots. You put a little salt on your steak. You put a little salt on whatever you're eating, the little fried rice you got. You put a little salt in there. It make, makes things feel really good and tasteful, but also it's used inside those same foods as a preservative to keep it lasting longer and to make it healthy and precious and all those things in packaging. So we know that salt has great value. And Jesus likens us, the church, the men and women of God, his church unto salt. I think it's ironic he uses salt because salt really, unless you have a good eye, you'll miss salt. If I were to take a salt shaker tonight and just literally dump it all over this little podium right here, you, from the distance you're at, you wouldn't be able to see it. And isn't it ironic he called us to be salt, to have so much power and purpose to bring flavor? I, I believe that we as Christians, Victor, we should be flavorful, that someone that is in the world, someone at your workplace, someone in your neighborhood should, Alvin, look at your life and be like, man, I want to be like them. They got flavor. They got salsa. They got spice. They got some jukes. They've got some jives. They got something in them, Charlie Brown. They got something in them. There, there should be a flavor up in our lives that people go, I, I want that. But also there's this side of salt that brings the preservation that we are to be the light preserved to those that are out there. We are to be an agent in this world that is dying to bring back life and to bring back hope. You, you get what the flavor and the preservation does, but I think it's ironic because he uses us as salt because salt is often unseen. It's unnoticed. There's nothing sexy or glamorous about a little bucket or a little jar of salt, is there? No one walks into a restaurant and like, whoa, look at the salt shakers. Beautiful. Will you pour me out. No, they say, I want the T-bone steak. I want the grilled chicken. I want the salmon that's been crusted in that great sauce. They, they want the dessert, like the cheesecake or the creme brulee, right? No one gets excited about the salt, but the salt is a purposeful ingredient that makes things happen. So why would Jesus use us as an illustration under salt? Because Jesus wants us to do the work, but all the credit and the glory goes to him, not us. Why? Because he knows that we can't handle it. We weren't made and built to be famous. You want proof? Go straight out right now to California and you'll see very quickly that none of these teenagers, none of these kids, and none of these adults can handle fame. It goes straight to their head. They gain power. They gain authority. They got entitlement. And often their life, not all of them, but a lot of them, go down the path of destruction. So Jesus said, I want you to be salt. Life preserving and full of flavor, and I want you to kind of be unseen. Mm, that's kind of beautiful, isn't it? I like that. I like that. And then he says, and then he says that you're going to be this light of the world, light of the world. There's a city that's on a hill, but no one would put a lamp under a basket. Why? Because if you put a lamp under a basket, it would be destructive. And in Jesus' day, they didn't have the beautiful Thomas at Edison uh, uh, electricity that we have. Their lights were actually like flames. And if you put a flame under a basket, it would be destructive. And what Jesus is saying to you and me is, is that when you turn a flame for God, when you become a Christian, when you become a son or daughter of Christ, if you try to hide what he put in you, then it too is destructive. 
And we come to church and we walk about and we sometimes can be ashamed, whether we really think about it or not. We sometimes get environments where we're ashamed of Christ and we don't want to tell and expose to everybody that we're Christians. And the Bible says that when we try to hide that light, it is destructive. But Jesus said what? He said that light is meant to go up on a hill and give light to all who are in the house and in the ways. And this is to be shined before all men. And once again, to point the good works, not at us, but at him. Just like the salt has no sexiness to it. Watch this. Neither does the light. Most of you walk in this room and you've never looked. I'll I'll give you a little moment. You've never looked up and counted the lights. You, you, you don't, I do this because I'm meticulous and careful. In fact, tonight I saw cobwebs up and down this little crease line right here. And side note, we got to get the little zoomy zoomy and get up there and get those cobwebs out. So I noticed, I noticed I'm looking at these lights up here and I notice there's a couple of them in and out and I look at these lights up in here and sometimes I'll count the lights and see if they're all on or off. But the majority of us come in this room and you don't ever look at the lights. You know why? Because they're not that cool. But you know what you do get? You get produce and results from the light. You walk in and the light guides your path. If we turned out all the lights and with these black chairs and no lights in here, it would be a crazy party up in here, wouldn't it? People would be falling and messing up their legs and tripping all over stuff. That light gives you direction and it also provides a way of truth. There is a glow of truth that's in it that brings you to this place that creates the atmosphere. And so is salt, so is light. Light is there to provide truth and direction without taking all of the glory. So it is with the sun when you wake up in the morning, you enjoy its warmth and beauty and you don't go, oh, let me get on the other side of the garage where I can see where the sun's at. Oh, let me get over here on the other side of the house where I can see where the sun's at. No, 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 no. The sun is out. You can't see it, but you enjoy its truth and its direction and warmth in your life. And so Jesus called us not just to be salt, but he called us to be light, 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 so that the glory and the fame doesn't point to us, but so that we point to him. Hmm, salt and light. So back in 2008, my wife and I were starting a ministry called Youth Alive. And one night I had this dream, and I want tonight to share with you that dream real quickly. I had this dream that shook me. You know, a lot of times we have dreams, and maybe just because we had bad pizza, we had dreams because we, you know, maybe saw something spooky on TV. But this, this was one of those, I don't have many of them, this was one of those God dreams, Cindy. One of those God dreams that woke me up in the middle of the night, one of those God dreams that gripped me the next day, one of those God dreams that kept me moved and motivated for the weeks and months to come. But I I do have to be honest with you. There are weeks and even months that go by that I forget about this dream. And it's really, really sad, right? That if God shook me to the grips of who I am, you would think that every day when I get up and every night when I go to bed, I would think about this dream. But I got to be honest, there are months and months that go by that I've forgotten about this dream. And this dream is heart wrenching. This great dream will really shake you to the core. This will, and it did, it messed me up, but yet it shows our ability as humans and even Christians to wonder, to become lazy and complacent. To really sometimes put God on the back burner and not give him our all after full pursuit. So in this dream, me and my wife and a couple of our pastor friends and their wives, we were coming home after a late night of ministry. We had sung and preached and we had great altar times. We ministered to the people and we were actually moving from one city to the next city to minister to people. And as we were driving along in our little van, as one of those typical Ford white vans you've seen on the road, as we maneuvered through the towns and the cities, we came out into what I would call a countryside. It would be dark. There'd be no city lights. As we went further and further, the lights became less and less, and the scene became darker and darker. And I remember distinctly turning right down this country, this farm road. And I remember like this little stand, this like little corner. It wasn't a building. It wasn't a shack. It was more of like a little, uh, like almost like watch house. And we turned down that road and we went down. I noticed to see the road started to become unusual. There was this high bank up on the left side that kind of washed out to a lower valley on the right side. And as we went down this road, it got darker and darker. 
And all of a sudden, we started coming along. We're happy, you know, 15 people got saved at this last meeting, and we just sang the latest Hillsong song, and everything's, everything's good in our world. But as we went further and further down this road, we started to see dead people and dead things. I mean, we drove up down the road, and we saw a car that look like the family, a mom and a dad and their son and daughter, a cute American family of four, that they were there. And it was like their faces were frozen from shock and they were dead. We went a little bit further and we saw a whole school bus, April, a whole school bus of kids inside the school bus and they were all dead inside. And it was like tragedy, it was disaster, it was a monstrosity. So we went a little bit further and further, we saw people on motorcycles that were dead, dead bodies laying all over this valley. We went a little bit further, and I saw, I remember distinctly, like a farm truck with a cattle trailer. You've seen those big, big cattle trailers full. And I remember, I remember seeing the driver dead and all the cattle in the trailer dead. So we went down this road further and further. The mass casualty became greater and greater. The carnage bodies literally piling up on the side of the road, in the middle of the road. And here is the sad part. We were so busy with our own schedule that we were trying to get over the bodies as fast as possible to get to our next destination, the next place, the next place that we almost missed what was happening. And in the middle of us going over and driving through and driving around, in the middle of us making our way halfway down this road, we hear behind us these sirens that begin to go off. It was a loud commotion. It was an alarm. It was almost like a warning. And these people chased us down and said, you got to get out of the valley. You, get, you, you can't keep going. You have to turn around. You've got to go back. And in this moment, we started to think questions like, dude, what in the world is going on? What, why are all these people dead? Is this going to happen to us? What happened to cause? Was it an electric shock? Like, what happened for all these people to die in this valley? And they said, no questions. Let's get you back. And it was at that time the Lord stirred my heart that me and my family, me and my wife, that we as sons and daughters, that we would go back to that little guard shack and we would become watchmen. We did not want anyone else to die in the valley. Why? Because the officials, the emergency people, they literally told us that at any time, at any moment, over that dam, that big mountainside, water would come rushing over like a deluge and would fill the valley. And anything caught in the valley would be washed out and dead and deteriorate and be gone. And they said, you don't want to be in the valley. We say, wait, 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 wait. How often does this happen? They says, we don't know. It could come at any moment, at any time, but you don't want to be in the valley. And so we hightailed it and we got back to the corner. And I remember in that, that, that that moment, God literally burning in my heart and piercing my heart. and said, Kyle, you will stand on the corner and be the alarm. Will you be the watchman? Will you stand up and cry out that no one else will go down the street? Will you save people from destruction? Will you say, oh, come on, you see where I'm going? Will you save people from hell? Will you save people from the burning and the gnashing of teeth? Will you save them from the demonics of hell? Will you stand on the street corner and be the alarm and the sound? For me and my family, we said yes, that we would be the watchman. Four simple things that I took from that little dream that night that shook me up that I want to relay to you. And hopefully you learn what I learned is number one, that it was the travel. That in my busy day-to-day -day life, I often get so consumed with what I'm doing that I forget what they're doing. I don't, I don't know if anybody else gets that. You, you, you got to get the kids to soccer practice and you got to get to this appointment. You got to get home. And you got to cook dinner for the family and you got to get the yard mowed and you got issues going on with your aunts and your uncles. And some of you are at an age where you're taking care of your mom and dad. And there's all of these things going on around you. And in our day to day life, sometimes we miss that God's in the middle of it. And this is what we think. We think that if we're going to stand on the street corner and tell people about Jesus, that we've got to literally go out and do it. No, 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 no. The people are already around you and you don't even have to change what you're doing if we would just wake up and see that they're all around us that God is in the middle of our everyday lives we don't have to go chase after him we don't have to change our routine God says I want you to be the watchman I want you to be the watchwoman and it's in the middle of what you're already doing so out of this out of this dream God put a burning desire inside of me to pray 
I mean, like a passion to pray, a passion to go after him, a passion to call out for souls, a passion to hear his voice, a passion to awaken me to where I can get my self-centered self out of his way so that he can use me to invest in others. Because this is what usually happens. And you've probably heard me say this before. We go into a restaurant, we go into a store, we go into a family reunion, we go into a place. And the, the first thing that's usually on our minds is ourselves. How does my butt look in these jeans? Does my breast smell? Is my hair okay? Does my shirt look okay? Untalked or talked? And we're only really preoccupied with us. So who changes? Us. If we are the only things on our minds, then the only thing that can change is us. But if we can take our attention off us, and that comes through prayer, Prayer is about our communion with God. Prayer is about learning who he is. Prayer is about listening to what he wants us to do. And when we pray, God always takes the attention on us and puts it on others. When I pray, you come to mind. When I pray, my kids and family come to mind. When I pray, God gives me unusual ideas to think. And when I don't pray, I don't move. But when I pray, God moves me. And out of my day-to-day travel, He does something great inside of me. And it always, James, has something to do with others. Amen? The second thing I see was the carnage. When I drove down this road, Missy Mitchell, I saw saw these things. And you you, you see the parallels. There was a family, the mom and the dad and the two kids, stereotypical Americans. It, It was the families. It was the families that needed to be reached. When I went through and I saw the school buses, you would obviously see that that was the schools, that our schools in America, they need Jesus. Pastor is actually going to be talking about this in two weeks on May the 22nd. He's bringing in a guest and we're going to talk about how we save our kids from the education and all the stuff that's coming down the pipe. Like literally our kids, the public schools, our private schools, the, all these schools, even these charter schools. Listen, they're not all perfect. Our kids need Jesus. When I drove by and we saw those buses, it, was, it, it birthed inside of me a passion to pray for our schools. You and I every day drive by in our normal day lives, five to six, some 10, 12 schools, don't we? From elementary to middle to high schools. It's an opportunity for us to bust in and begin to pray for those principals. Pray for those teachers, those coaches, those students who are lost, who are being told it's okay to be transgender and gay and do whatever you want to do. You want to be a dog, be a dog. Come on, they're being fed all kinds of lies and all kinds of rubbish. And we have an opportunity to stand up and be the watchman and the watchwoman. We have that opportunity. It's the schools. And then I saw, I saw, I said, God, what was, what was that truck and that trailer full of cattle? And he said, at my church. Come on, it's a pastor that's in that Ford F-150, that Ford F-350, and he's pulling a bunch of cows behind him. And he, like a, uh, uh, the blind leading the blind, was leading them down the path of destruction. And it was, for me, a wake-up call in this dream to begin to pray for our churches and pray for our pastors, a bunch of lukewarm Christianity that's going out there, not a lot of hot, burning, raging passion for God, a bunch of people that are lukewarm. And the Bible says that the lukewarm gets spit out of his mouth. And this was a wake-up call for me, for our pastors to stop leading our sheep and our churches down the wrong paths. Come on, that little motorcycle, that little motorcycle guy. God says, come on, that's the atheist. It's the individual who thinks they can do it all by themselves. And God just began to walk me through the carnage. He's saying, Kyle, will you burn? Will you be broken for the lost? The truth is the thing that missed me the most about God is this. Brooke, that he loves all people. Because there's no way in you and me, we have the capacity to love everyone. In fact, there's a lot of people, Roosevelt, that I just don't want to like. There's people around the globe that I can't stand, but I've never met them. But God loves even our enemies. God loves me and he loves you. And God said, will you be broken for the lost? Will you be broken for those who are hurting? Will you be broken for the lesbian community? Will you be broken for the transgender community? Will you be broken for the Republicans? Will you be broken for the Democrats? Will you be all of the Muslims and atheists and all the, will you be broken for people? You see, because today we've become more divided than we've ever been. Oh, we speak unity, but it's a bunch of rubbish. We're more divided than we've ever been. And God says, will you cross the line? Will you go across the aisle? And will you love and be broken? Because the fact is, there are millions, let me repeat it, millions that are dangling over the pit of hell. And by one little shoelace, by one little dental floss string, they're literally moments away from dying and spending eternity in hell. Most of us, we're just worried about getting our grass mowed. 
what we're gonna eat tomorrow. And oh, the gas prices are so high. And God said, Kyle, with a million people dangling over the pit of hell, what are you going to do? And I said, three, I'm gonna be a watchman. The God through this, the third thing was I decided to dedicate my life to be a watchman, to stand on the corner and wave the flag and sound the alarm and be the bridge so that no one else would be lost. You see, I want to be a burning man. I want to pray when no one else wants to pray. I want to give it an offering when no offering's being taken up. I want to jump in and say no to all the stupid stuff when everyone else is saying yes to it. I want to be the one that has radical praise and radical devotion and gets up and reads my Bible when no one else is doing it. I want, I want to be a burning man. You see, it's easy to burn when everyone else is burning. If we took tonight a whole bunch of uh, 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 trees and they were on fire, it'd be easy. It'd be so easy to take a burning, a non-burning tree and throw it into those trees. What would that non-burning tree do? It would catch on fire because there's already a group of them that are on fire. But it's so much harder for a group of trees that aren't on fire to be lit. It just takes one person to strike a match and to jump in yourself and light the whole forest on fire. And that's what I'm looking for. That's what I want to be. I want to be the one that walks into a dry, barren, boring environment environment and strike my own match and jump in and let them burn. I want to be, I want to be a burning man that goes after God with everything, with everything I have. I will, and I want you, I want you to join me tonight to be a watchman, to stand on the corner and sound the alarm. The fourth and final thing, worship team, you can come on. The fourth and final thing was simply this. It was the timing. It was that the end is now. The time is short. It's right upon us. But even in that, I saw, even in that, I saw joy that there was still time for recovery. That even though it seemed like that that water could come over that mountain, could come over that dam, that at any moment it could happen, there was still time. That time wasn't wasted. That I still could get out and save them. I could get out and bring them home. Just like Samson, in the final moments of his life, he saved more in the final seconds than he did in his entire life. And so it is for you and me and this church. It may seem like darkness is getting bigger. It may seem like hell is winning. But we, in the final moments, as time is short and the end is near, we can go out and save and recover and bring back. We can do that. In fact, yesterday we started an attempt. My man, Jariah, Jariah, wave your hand back here. We started an attempt yesterday where we went to the Collin County Jail and Prison, and they gave us as a church an open door to go in. It began to last. Time is short. End is near. For a lot of these people that are facing federal prison, for a lot of these men and women who are facing 20, 30, 40 years in jail, for us to go in, even though it seems like the sentence is final, even though it seems like their life is over, someone can go in and rip them out of that jail cell and bring hope in Jesus to them the same way it was for Jariah. Jariah spent 22 years years in jail and he got fired up for Jesus and he's become a watchman and now full circle dry is going back to that jail cell in those prisons and he's telling them about Jesus that you may be locked up for a short time but God's going to bust you open for a long time and we are and some of you you're going to go with us we're going to go to that jail cell and we're going to preach Jesus to them and we're going to be the watchman we're going to be the one standing on the corner so that they don't end up dead and destructive and burning and going to hell that's what we want Matthew chapter 7, I close. Worship team's here. Matthew chapter 7, I close with this scripture. It says this. So whatever you wish that others do to you, do to them also, for this is the law and the prophets. You know what I always think about that? I used to always think about like, oh, I want somebody to be nice to me and say good things and give me a treat, maybe a brownie and help me with my taxes. And when we really think about that, we think of goofy stuff. Do unto others as they have them do unto you. Oh, they would open up their parking space so I can get in the front row, right? They, they would compliment me on my new Easter dress. We think of the stupidest stuff when it comes to that verse, but really the Lord dropped this on me as I was preparing for this message. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. How about telling somebody about Jesus? Wouldn't you want somebody standing on the street corner before you drove down it to hear the good news, the plan of salvation? Wouldn't you want that? More than a brownie or a compliment, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And this is what it says, verse 13, you've heard this. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who in it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And there are a few who find it. Mm. Church, I'm just wondering tonight, freedom. Is there anybody in here that is willing to stand up and say, Kyle, I will be the watchman. 
I will be the watchwoman who stands up and helps people find the narrow road because that road, it leads to life 